a draft of a presentation that I will, I will be giving at the American Physical Society Division of Fluid Dynamics meeting on Sunday, the 24th of November in Seattle at the convention center there. These are 10 minute talks. This talk is basically a 10 minute version of the video that we did for the Gallery of Fluid Motion, which is on YouTube. Um, the talk will, talks at this conference are generally 10 minutes. Uh, so that's just a, a, a plug for that video. Um, all right, so if you know me, you know that I, I love baseball. And part of the reason that I think baseball is so interesting is the ball itself. Uh, it, any flying sphere has interesting and complicated physics, but baseballs have a unique seam pattern. The seams are raised, they have an uh, interesting shape. And all of that allows them to behave in ways that they were never intended to, which I think makes us very fortunate. And so I just wanted to point out in case uh, it wasn't obvious, whether the use of the word clever in my title was meant to be ironic. Nobody ever intended for the baseball to uh, behave the way it does. We don't even really know why it is stitched together the way it is. That, that has been lost to history. Um, generally, in baseball, pitching is the pitches are manipulated either on how hard they throw, are thrown or the axis on which they spin, which is the main effect you're looking at here with you, Darvish. He's able to cause the, the uh, baseball to spin on a different axis and therefore move in different directions due to the Magnus effect. Um, and uh, that's what most people think about when they think about baseball pitching, but that's exactly what I'm not here to talk about. I want to talk about the possibility of manipulating baseball pitches using something other than the Magnus effect. And uh, we'll be doing this by showing the flow field around uh, baseballs that are thrown across our lab. Um, this is a, a movie of our acquisition system as the baseball flies through this big box that's filled with theater fog. It uh, triggers our, PI, our particle image velocimetry system and takes two pictures of the ball as it goes by. And here's an example of two of those pictures. This is some of our early data. This is an old high school ball. Um, all the data I'm going to be showing today is going to be major league balls that generally are not spinning. Um, uh, because we're not looking at Magnus effect. Uh, I want to start by showing what flow looks like if the ball is smooth. This is a ball that we've built to be the size and shape and weight of a baseball, but it's made out of plastic and it's smooth. And uh, the boundary layers separate from this ball um, while they're laminar, which uh, results in a very large wake. Uh, and this, is, this has been known for hundreds of years that this would happen, but if we, if we trip the, the boundary layer by putting uh, a little obstacle here, the, uh, both boundary layers become turbulent and uh, result in a much smaller wake. Well, it's interesting, baseball is going to have both of these effects. So if I look at um, uh, a baseball, if there's no seam on the front of the ball, uh, so in this case I have no seam that's uh, on this side of the ball in front, the, the flow can be laminar, and this is a, a very high resolution PIV picture of a laminar flow, which separates before it even gets to the middle of the ball and rolls up into these nice Calvin Helmholtz vortices. And this is a really pretty picture, but in my view, that this, this is almost never important to baseballs in flight. Um, it's very difficult to maintain a smooth surface all the way from the front of the ball to, um, to the middle of the ball with, without encountering a seam. And, uh, and so, and if, if you can conspire to have that happen, if the ball's rotating, uh, generally the, this effect would be countered on the other half of the rotation and have no net effect. But um, seams in the back of the ball, I think, is where it's at. I, I think that this is what's new for uh, the, the new information that we're putting out there is to follow what happens on the back. So here is you know, a ball traveling uh, right to left in a two seam configuration. And I'm gonna show you several different snapshots uh, with those seams in different locations. And what, you would, what I want you to notice is that the flow on the top of the ball, the bottom, let's talk about the bottom first. The bottom's laminar and, uh, the, and it separates and, and leaves a, uh, uh, at it pretty straight off the back of the ball, resulting in a large wake. But this seam on the, on the front here is gonna cause the flow on the top to be turbulent. And, and as a result, it, uh, it stays attached longer, reaches that back seam. But what the back seam tends to do is cause the flow to separate as soon as it's encountered. So having a seam on the back of the ball, ball while the flow is turbulent will cause the boundary layer to separate at the seam location up to some angle. Uh, and then uh, if it's on the back of the ball, it, it, nothing happens anymore. So here's, the, here's another example. The ball's now in a four seam configuration. Watch what happens on the bottom. The, the flow on the bottom and the top is, is turbulent because of those seams that are on the front. But that seam that's on the back right here 
uh, as the ball rotates, that boundary layer detaches from the seam. Uh, now, when the seam's too far forward, it, the, the, that no longer occurs, and it's interesting at the same angle. Uh, now, this flow is detaching from the seam on the top of the ball uh, and stays attached to that as the, as the uh, ball rotates. And so, as, as you go through this rotation, you see the wake is moving up and down, and that uh, we're having some impact on the force, uh, force in the ball. Uh, note that if the wake is deflected, that means that there's a net pressure force and, and, and there's a, a force on the ball due to that asymmetry. And I'll talk more about that in a second. We've made a map of how this works for Major League Baseballs. Uh, generally, if there's a seam anywhere from 6 degrees in front of the, the hemisphere line to 18 degrees behind it, the flow will separate off that seam. Uh, this is all assuming that the flow is turbulent coming in. Uh, if there's no seam there, uh, but the flow is turbulent, it will uh, stay attached 12 degrees beyond that, shown here in the orange. So generally, the way that this works is if you think of these red dots as blobs of fluid, they're, they're coming in, they're hitting the stagnation on the front of the ball and then moving around it. They hit that seam, become turbulent, and, um, and then we end up with this relatively small wake. Um, what's important here is that the flow at the nose of the ball at the front is very, or the pressure there is very high, and it decreases as these blobs go around the ball, and then it tries to start increasing again as you reach the back of the ball. Uh, but then when the flow boundary layer separates, as soon as the separation happens, the pressure stops changing. And uh, so we never reach the pressure on the back of the ball that we had in the front of the ball. That's what drag, that's, that, that, that's basically drag. Um, so the reason I bring that up is that now if the ball is uh, oriented a little differently, and we look at that same process, now one of these sides is separating before the other. That means that there's a net pressure difference between the two sides of the ball and a force on the ball. Uh, and and that's, that's what we're going to be focusing on here. Um, we call that a seam shifted wake. Uh, it's been called a laminar flow effect by, by a, a lot of folks. Um, we de disagree that this has anything to do with laminar flow or that you could even have laminar flow very far on either side of this ball in this configuration. Um, uh, I, and I think, and, and the folks that call it that, I think are exactly right about what's happening to the ball and perhaps wrong about why it's happening. Uh, and I should note that uh, this is somewhat of a joke, but uh, Andrew Smith, my grad student, came up with that term and he'd like to trademark that. So if you use that, you need to send him a check. Okay, so these uh, effects have been used for probably decades or hundreds of years, uh, what's called a knuckleball. Uh, this is a lot of fun to watch. This is a pitch that has a random orientation, it's not really rotating as it uh, goes into home plate, it, and as a result and of the effects that I've been showing you, um, you the force in the ball can change as it flies, and it, uh, you can have this really random motion. Uh, right now, I, I don't believe anybody in the major league is throwing a knuckleball. It's very difficult to do. It takes a long time to learn. Um, so this is somewhat academic at this point, but we want to pose the question, what would happen if you could cause this effect to be stable? Uh, and one way you could do that is if you rotate it on an axis like I'm showing here with this drill, uh, then that, that seam on the top is always, for three quarters of the time, in the same position. And then you could deflect the flow in a steady fashion. And, uh, and, and this is, I think, currently being done, and the, one of the best examples I've seen of it is Steven Strasberg's changeup. That's, a, that's a, a view of it there. You can see the way he threw it, and I'm going to repeat it several times here. And you see my video on the left. Uh, and how that uh, ball, the, the pitch, looks like it's in a similar orientation to that. I believe that shifts the, the weight of the ball and causes a downward force on it. So note that this, there's, there's very little Magnus effect vertically on this pitch. And what there is is, is in, in an upward direction. But if you go and collect all of the change-ups that Steven Strasberg threw this year, um, this is a histogram of all of them. Uh, what, what I want to point out is that... Uh, uh, about 10% of them accelerate downward with more than the force of gravity, uh, which is pretty interesting given that the, if there's any vertical um, magnus force on the, this pitch, it's in the upward direction, not in the downward direction. So the only thing that could be forcing this ball downward, and if you watch this pitch, watch the catcher's mitt, and watch how it drops, especially very late, um, uh, you can see that there, there's something else going on there. And I believe this his changeup has this seam shifted wake. So, uh, I came up with uh, um, Strasburg as an example, thanks to Rob Friedman, the pitching ninja. Uh, we came up with that choice just before the playoffs started, 
And uh, Strasburg nearly blew his first uh, wild card playoff game and would have been irrelevant in the playoffs. Uh, as it turns out, uh, we were very lucky. He went on to become the World Series MVP, in at least part because of this particular pitch. So we can repeat this in the lab, and here's our attempt at doing this. These are two pitches overlaid, and they have the same spin axis and the same speed, uh, but one of them is oriented like a laminar or, uh, for the seam shifted wake, and the other one's not. And the one that has that orientation drops more than the other one. It has a downward acceleration due to that seam orientation. So now moving on to um, fastballs. This is a sinker being thrown by Stroman on the left, and you notice that has a the pitch has a arbitrary orientation of the ball. It's just flop, uh, uh, flopping around. The one on the right is what ba uh, Trevor Bauer calls a laminar express, and it has this orientation I'm talking about. It's tilted somewhat compared to uh, what we uh, what I've been talking about. Uh, it has a different axis, but it still has that orientation where there's a seam that's parked on the back of the ball that's going to cause um, uh, separation on one side before the other. And uh, uh, we, we repeated this also in the lab. This data on the right is acquired at the Washington State Sports Science Lab. Again, two pitches of the same rotation, same speed. One of them has this orientation that's shown in the drill on the left, the other one does not. And that moves up and to the right, like Bowers, like Bowers pitch did. Let me see if I can get that to repeat again. So that seam orientation matters. And I think that that's new for baseball aerodynamics. I don't think anybody's ever been able to show before that once the ball leaves the pitcher's hands, the seams matter at all anymore. Uh, I believe they do, but it re does require this rather precise orientation of the ball, and uh, it, I th which I think is challenging to do. And I think uh, for real pitchers, it, it, it's a little flaky. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, that's, that's my take on what I've seen. So in conclusion, uh, uh, the MLB baseball a seam on the rear of the ball can control the boundary layer separation and thus its wake. That may be useful for adding force to a pitch like the laminar express or like Strasburg's uh, changeup, uh, but I don't think there's any laminar effect there. So I just also wanted to put a plug in for our website, baseballarrow.com, where we have a lot more of this kind of information um, in a, a lot of these studies that we've done. And I also wanted to acknowledge a few folks. Uh, John Garrett and Andrew Smith acquired all the data that you've seen here. Nasmus Saqib was the original student on this project and built a lot of the apparatus. Uh, Lloyd Smith of the Washington State Sports Science Lab has been really crucial to everything we've done, provided the cannon that you see uh, standing in front of John and, and Andrew up there. And then finally, Eric Jaggers, who's now of the Reds, previously of Driveline and then of the Phillies, who was the one that originally um, convinced me that this could be done. So uh, I think we've, we're finally showing it, and uh, I wanted to thank him for putting us on to this interesting topic. Thank you.